Hi. Peace be with you. My name is Rodolfo Martin Vitancol, a Gemini. In this video, I will present to you the book of Revelation is a hoax. There are lots of hoaxes or fake stories in the Bible that were presented as truths that up to now have been fooling the whole Christian world. There is the story of Adam and Eve, the story of the Great Flood, the story of the Exodus, the story of Yahweh, and the Gospel of Paul. The book of Revelation is but just another hoax in the Bible, a mere fabrication of a man, never truly a revelation of the Son of Man. Eight proofs that the book of Revelation is a hoax. Proof number one. Revelation is a product of research, not a vision. Revelation is very Old Testament. It borrowed extensively from the Old Testament. It has correlation to the many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. Evidently, the author has mastery of all the prophecies in the Old Testament which he used to the hilt to create his own version of prophecy with Jesus as his claim manifesto. Proof number two. Revelation is largely a plagiarized work. Being classified as a book of prophecy, Revelation is not something that is unique and original. On the contrary, it contains visions that are filled with so many striking similarities with the visions of some of the Old Testament prophets, such as Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. Revelation extracted many of the images from the Old Testament prophets and then modified them a little to suit his prophetic work, where it is Jesus Christ that he made the central figure as against Yahweh, as the central figure of the Old Testament prophets. I'm going to give you just a few examples of the plagiarism revelation committed upon the works of some of the Old Testament prophets. Let's take the case of Isaiah. As I read Isaiah's verses, watch out for the words throne, six wings, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Isaiah 6, 1 to 6. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The images of throne, six wings, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty will also appear in Revelation. Here is Revelations. Revelation 4, 6 to 8. Also in front of the throne, there was that look like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's go to Daniel, where the striking similarities with Revelations are so plenty. I will just cite four. First striking similarity. As I read Daniel's verses, watch out for the words, Hair on head was white like wool, white as snow, and flaming with fire. Daniel 7, 9 to 10. As I look, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. The images of hair on head was white like wool, white as snow, and flaming with fire will also appear in Revelation. Here is Revelations. Revelation 1, 13 to 14. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Second striking Similarity. As I read Daniel's verses, watch out for the words lion, bear, and leopard. Daniel 7, 4 to 6. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And behold, another beast a second one like a bear. After this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. The images of lion, bear, and leopard will also appear in Revelation. Here is Revelations. Revelation 13, 2. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Third striking similarity. As I read Daniel's verses, Watch out for the words, made war with the saints. 
Daniel 7, 21. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. The image of made war with the saints will also appear in Revelation. Here is Revelations. Revelation 13, 7. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Fourth striking similarity. As I read Daniel's verses, watch out for the words, mouth, speaking great things. Daniel 7, 8 to 11. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. The image of mouth Speaking great things will also appear in Revelation in a somewhat modified way. Here is Revelations, Revelation 13, 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Let's go to Ezekiel, where striking similarities with Revelation also abound. I will just cite three. First striking similarity. As I read Ezekiel's verses, watch out for the words throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated on the throne, was a likeness of human appearance. Ezekiel 1, 26 And above the expanse over their heads there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. The images of throne in appearance like sapphire and seated on the throne was a likeness of human appearance will also appear in Revelation in a somewhat modified way. Here is Revelations. Revelation 4, 2-3 At once I was in the Spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne and he who sat there in the appearance of jasper and carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald second striking similarity as i read ezekiel's verses Watch out for the words, seal on the forehead. Ezekiel 9, 4 And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men. The image of seal on the forehead will also appear in Revelation in a somewhat modified way. Here is Revelations. Revelation 7, 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Third striking similarity. As I read Ezekiel's verses, Watch out for the words, third part. Ezekiel 5.2 A third part you shall burn in the fire in the midst of the city. And a third part you shall take and strike with the sword 
all around the city. And the third part, you should scatter to the wind. The images of third part will also appear in Revelation in a somewhat modified way. Here is Revelations. Revelation 8, 12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Let's go to Zagaria, where I will just cite one. As I read Zechariah's verses, watch out for the words red horses, black horses, white horses, and dappled horses. Zechariah 6, 1-4 Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses. The images of red horses, black horses, white horses, and dappled horses will also appear in Revelation. Except for the dappled horses, which was changed into a pale horse. Here is Revelations. Revelation 6, 1-8 I heard one, one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come, and I look, and behold, a white horse. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I look, and behold, a pale horse. So there you are, plagiarism at its best, yes? The funny thing here is, the author even gave a warning, and I read Revelation 22, 18 to 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city. Did you hear that? He is very careful that his plagiarized work be tampered with by anyone. Preposterous, yes? Or evil? Proof number three. Jesus never delivers his message 
incomprehensibly. He will leave no room for any misunderstanding. Jesus will even use parables so that his message be made so crystal clear that even little children can very well understand it. Jesus is a man of simplicity. For instance, he came with only one true God, his Father. He came with only one doctrine, love. He came with only one mission, life. He came with only one way to his Father, Jesus. Sad to say, the Jesus of Revelation turns out to be the exact opposite. The Jesus of Revelation uses loads and loads of symbols and allegories that are so bizarre and outlandish that even Jesus himself in heaven can never ever get to correctly interpret any of them. With so many bizarre and outlandish images, Revelation can be more in the genre of fantasy literature in the likes of Harry Potter more than an apocalyptic literature in the likes of Daniel. For instance, I will read to you a partial list of symbols and allegories that Revelation is riddled with and see for yourself if you can get even half of the meaning of each. One, the seven flaming torches burning in front of the throne. Two, the seven spirits of God. Three, the four living creatures. Four, the six wings that each of the four living creatures has. Seven, five, the seven horns and seven eyes that the Lamb has. Six, the four winds of the earth. Seven, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars becoming dark. Eight, a third of the land burned up. Nine, a third of the sea turned to blood. Ten, a third of all the water turned to warm wood. 11. The measuring of the temple of God. 12. The 12 stars on the crown of the woman's head. 13. The red dragon. 14. The seven heads and ten horns of the red dragon. 15. The two wings of the great eagle that was given to the woman. 16. A year, two years, and half year that the woman was taken care of. 17. The earth that helped the woman. 18. The first beast. 19. The ten diadems on the horns of the first beast. 20. The 42 months that the first beast was given authority to act. 21 the second beast, 22, the two horns of the second beast, 23, the number 6, 6, 6, 24, the three angels, 25, the sharp sickle, 26, the seven last plagues, 27, 
the sea of glass mingled with fire. 28. The seven hills. 29. The seven kings. 30. The eight king. 31. The ten kings who have not yet been crowned. 32. The pearl in each of the twelve gates. And many, many other more. I am aware that many have come forward to interpret the many symbols and allegories there are in the book. But the, but the question is, are they 100% correct? This I will tell you. A message that cannot be clearly understood is like picking up a strange looking object and after studying it and finding no any good value in it you throw it away as nothing but rubbish Proof number four. Only the Father knows when the world will end. Not even the angels in heaven, nor Jesus knows it. Mark 13. 32. Jesus said, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. I tell you, at the rate, we are conducting ourselves in this world, notably our world leaders. The world is likely to be ended by us, not by God. Just consider the war today in Ukraine. A possible good start for another world war, yes? And what is Ukraine war all about? Greed. Proof number five. Jesus has not come yet. Revelation 22, 20. The one who gives this testimony says, Yes, I am coming soon. Two thousand years have already passed. Even as tens of billions of Christians have already died from since the author of Revelation prophesied the coming soon of Jesus, but Jesus is still to come. Yes. And how many more millennia and billions of Christians to die awaiting the second coming of Christ before Jesus finally comes again? Why not? Instead of waiting for the end to come, we all come together now to end all the evil and suffering in our world so that when Jesus finally comes, He comes in full glory, not in shame. 
in full victory, not in defeat. It makes more sense. Yes. In the first place, is his second coming really coming personally here on earth? Or his second coming really turning our world into a kingdom of God, where it is God, through his son Jesus, is the ruler and not man? Proof number six. Jesus gets illogical. All of Jesus' teachings are full of morals, logic, and wisdom. He would not have overcome the world if they were not that impactful. Yes. In contrast, the Jesus of Revelation is full of irrationality in his head. Let's take the case of Satan. Revelation 20, 1 to 3 and 20, 7 to 10. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tell me, where is the logic of binding Satan for a thousand years only to release him again to do his evil thing upon the world before you finally terminate him so that he can do no more evil again upon the world? Why not just throw him straight to hell from the very beginning. Where is the logic of the 1,000 years? In the first place, why still the need for the battle of Armageddon? God can exterminate Satan and the whole of his armies in one flick of a finger. Yes. Proof number seven. God 
becomes an imperfect creator. In Revelation, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The author of Revelation obviously copied this entire concept of new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem from the book of Isaiah. Here is Isaiah's. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad, and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives out who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. May I ask you, is our world, the whole universe, so imperfect that it needs to be obliterated and replaced with a new one? Do you really visualize a new earth where there is no longer any sea? as stated in Revelation, or a new earth where wild and carnivorous animals will no longer be wild and carnivorous, the weather will always be calm and pleasant, and people will take much longer time to get old, as stated in Isaiah. In other words, to you, life on earth will now be governed by a new kind of natural law, so diametrically different from the one we now have? For me, the earth, the creatures, the heavens, the entire universe, all that comprises life are but simply perfect. There is not one microscopic thing in the structure of life that ought to be changed. To change anything in it is an admission of a defect in the design by the Almighty Maker, which in effect is a defect 
in the maker himself. Sorry, but God is perfect. And I'm not saying that since God is perfect, therefore the world he created must be perfect. Rather, God must be perfect for the world he created is perfect. Can I repeat that? I am not saying that since God is perfect, therefore the world he created must be perfect. Rather, God must be perfect for the world he created is perfect. There will be no another physical creation. God was just perfect at first touch. If there is anything to change in our world, it is we and our destructive attitudes and behavior in life. It is by the changing of our attitudes and behavior in life that shall renew the world. And this is exactly what Jesus was all along pro proclaiming to the whole world when he came. Matthew 4, 17, Jesus said, Change your ways. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus has been asking the people of the world to change their ways of thinking their ways of living, their ways of working, their ways of relating with each other, their ways of seeking happiness, their ways of worshiping God, and other more ways needed to bring the fullness of life to each and every child of God in our world. Truly, it is the changing of our ways where at the center of our lives must be God, not ourself, that shall pave the way for the creation of a new heaven and a new earth, not the destruction of our physical world that has been so perfectly designed by a perfect God. Proof number eight. The Revelation author is not the same person as the Gospel author. The author of Revelation, whose name is John, or John of Patmos, as he is commonly referred to, was taken by the early church fathers to be the same person as John the Apostle, the author of the fourth gospel of Jesus. It is on this very weak ground of believing the two Johns to be one and the same person that the early church fathers made the book of Revelation canonical, making it to be the last book of the New Testament. I will offer just one argument that the two Johns, John the Apostle and John of Patmos, are not one and the same person. That one single argument is this. If there is any single word to describe John the Apostle as an evangelist, that single word is unique.
among all the four authors of the gospel of Jesus, John's work is the most unique. The three others are not, whose works are almost, almost similar to each other, making their gospels to be referred to as synoptic. John truly presented his gospel like none other. For instance, in all of the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see the many parables of Jesus. But in John's gospel, there is no parable, not a single one. Secondly, John's gospel is the only gospel among the four gospels where we have known from the very lips of Jesus that the one true God is his father and no one else. Let us give thanks to John for this, for had it not been for his gospel, the world would never have known about the one true God. Thirdly, John's gospel is the only gospel among the four gospels where Jesus clearly revealed his overall mission for the world, and that is to bring life, a life to the full. Fourthly, John's gospel is the only gospel among the four gospels where Jesus openly condemned the father of the Jews as a murderer, a master of deception, and the father of lies, clearly expressing his rejection of Yahweh as the one true God. Fifthly, John's Gospel is the only Gospel among the four Gospels where the very will of God for the world is so well defined, and that is love. Love one another as Jesus has loved us, treating its other like one brother and sister in God. Truly, if you want to know about the many teachings of Jesus, read the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But if you want to see the very soul of Jesus, read the Gospel of John. It is for this very reason of John being so unique that he can hardly be regarded as the same person as John of Patmos, whose book of Revelation is a perfect model of plagiarism. John of Patmos was so lacking in ingenuity that he simply found it much easier to just copy the works of others to create his own bogus prophecy. Worse, he used Jesus as the very one who manifested it to him. Isn't that maliciously evil?
In conclusion, this is what I can say. Founding your faith on some kind of sacred work that has been proven to be a hoax is like eating chemically treated food claiming to be healthy until one day you contracted a deadly disease from years of consuming it and it is already late. I have presented to you proofs that the book of Revelation is a hoax. It is up to you to believe it. In case you believe it, will you still continue making Revelation as one of the basis of your faith? This is what I can say, if you are a church follower, free yourself once and for all from the diabolical hold of deceptive teachings. Don't be a hard-headed sucker. Stop believing the teachings of your church concerning prophecies in Revelation as well as the other Bible stories that are also but hoaxes. I guarantee you, it will be good for your soul. On the other side, if you are a church leader, this is also what I can say. Have the courage to face your followers and tell them that the book of Revelation is a hoax and that you, should, you shall refrain from ever referencing it again in your preaching. Don't be afraid telling it to your people. It is better to lose your face than lose your soul. Amen. If you want to see a new light, a light you have never seen before, may I invite you to subscribe to this channel and walk with Jesus all the way to making his mission of life happen in our world. We owe it to our children and the children of our children, for all the generations to come, the making of our world a most beautiful and happy place for everyone, especially the poor and the oppressed among us, whom Jesus calls the least of his brothers and sisters. In the name of God, through his only son, Jesus, I wholeheartedly thank you for viewing this video presentation. May the Spirit of God be always with you so that you may always be guided by the one and only truth who is our Father in heaven through his only son, Jesus.